so for me, my, my primary focuses are my faith, my family and my fitness. Now I notice I don't mention my business in there because I think that if I can balance those three things really, really well, it's going to pour over into my business and my business is going to be succeed. It's going to succeed because I am succeeding in those other areas as well. Welcome to the painter growth podcast, where we help you scale your painting company in record time. Join us as we explore sales, marketing, hiring, finances, leadership, and more everything that you need to know to scale and grow your painting business. I hope you enjoy and subscribe. What's up everybody. Michael Hickman here, founder of paintergrowth.com. And I got a good one for you today. Uh, we have Brad Ellison, founder, CEO, Ellison painting. What is up my man? What is up? Hey, I hate when people say we got a good one and then introduce me because you're setting the bar too high. Let's set the bar really low. Like I think we're going to have a mediocre one today and then maybe people will be surprised. Under promise over deliver. That's what it's That's all right. about. My man. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we could talk about, you know, painting and business forever. So I think the really important thing is being focused so that the, the, the people can get the most out of it. So mm -hmm. I'm a family man. I have two kids. I have two girls, two and four, and you have a boy and a girl. Six and three. That's right. Right. So balance is a huge, important topic for a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people. Right. But it's hard to find balance when you're running a business because there's so many things pulling you each way. So let's just start with the, the big overarching question. How do you find balance when you're when you're running your painting business? Well, first off, I would say it's it's not something that a lot of contractors think about. I think a lot of people just get hyper focused on their their company or you know their their hobbies and they don't really put a big focus on a, an actually well balanced life. Uh, I think that's why a lot of people don't do it successfully. So when they look at people like me and and you I suppose and and other others of our friends that are in the industry that seem to be managing their personal and professional lives a little bit more successfully, it seems to be unusual, which is really disheartening. Right. I wish it was more common. So um, I guess if the question is, how do I do it? Well, the very let's, let's not go how let's first what let's define it. OK, right? what does balance mean to you? Balance means to me, uh, I, I guess I would say. Having having the pr priorities and those priorities being arranged in such a manner that each of the priorities is being focused on to an appropriate level. So balance doesn't, wouldn't necessarily mean half of your time spent on business, half of your time spent on your family or a third, a third, and then the other third spent on hobbies. I would say a balance is whatever is going to allow you to function more, um, as healthy as possible within the realms that you're trying to operate in. So balance is having priorities, following through on those priorities and, and managing our time and our energy resources so that those priorities can be paid attention to. So for me, my, my primary focuses are my faith, my family, and my fitness. Now, I notice I don't mention my business in there because I think that if I can balance those three things really, really well, it's going to pour over into my business and my business is going to be succeed. It's going to succeed because I am succeeding in those other areas as well. Okay. That's good. Very thorough definition. Let's, <laughs> let's bring it down a little more actionable. Um, so what does a perfect day look like for Brad Ellison? So I, first off, I don't work weekends. Weekends are for my family. Um, I work Monday through Friday. I typically wake up when my kids wake up around seven o'clock. I wish my kids slept till seven. Oh, I'm so lucky. They go to bed, <laughs> they go to bed pretty early and they sleep until about seven. So we wake up at seven. Uh, we make some coffee. We feed the dogs. We have a little bit of family time for about half an hour before I start getting ready for work. I usually uh, cut out about eight o'clock. First, first appointment is around 830. And then essentially from 830 till 230, I'm working. And that's primarily performing estimates, um, being interviewed on podcasts, yeah. uh, <laughs> managing my operations. But I have a pretty hard stop most days at 2.30. Because at 2.30, I head to the gym. And then from 3.30 to 4.30 or 4.45, I'm working out. Okay. Clean up, home for family dinner at 5 o'clock. 
family time between five and whenever my kids go to bed, which is usually by seven 30. And then if there's any other work that needs to get taken care of, responding to emails, sending out estimates, I'll take care of it after my kids go to bed. Um, but that is also time with my wife, which I also value. That's important time. Yeah, that is important time. It's a, uh, it's, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of similarities. Uh, one thing that I want to pull out is that you're running your business in 25 hours a week. Yeah. Well, if you, if you only less. count it between eight 30 to two 30. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A little bit, a little bit in the evenings, but let's say 30 hours, a 30 hours a week, if you did one hour a night. So what, uh, what's your business doing in, in revenue? And let's just, let's start there. What's your business doing in revenue? And what's the, what's the position that you hold in your business? So we are about 15 months in as the date of this recording. And we launched in uh, April of 2022 in between April and December, we sold and produced about a million dollars. So in the first seven months, we did a million dollars. The goal was 3 million total for 2023. Started out strong, about halfway through the year, we were at 1.5. We had some really, really crazy things happen in my business. One of my project managers was out for six weeks. Other project manager I had to fire. I stepped into project management and out of sales. So we are hoping to do 2.5 million this year, which would be really our first full calendar year. Awesome. That's a, that's an incredible startup story, man. (laughs) For being, you know, you take the average contractors, you know, journey and by year two, they are still on the tools or just like drowning and trying to keep up. What are you, what's, what's your background in business and how did you get to the point where you were able to just jump into a, a million dollar run rate? So my background is in sales and management. Um, I had started my first company when I was 19, which was a window washing company. So, uh, wow. and I had, I'd been a realtor, which was basically self-employed. My wife and I started was it with a, a company or on your own. I'm sorry. Was it with like a student painter thing or was it on your own? No, no, it was a window washing company. I mean, there's a student window, like college. Oh, no, no. I started or... my own. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Um, so we, uh, I, I sold life insurance for a bunch of years. My wife and I quit our full-time jobs and started a health insurance agency right after we got married and just kind of threw our eggs into the entrepreneurship bucket. Um, but And I have a degree in, in business. So you, you'll notice what's missing there is any history of painting. <laughs> I, I've never painted in my life. When, after we started our health insurance business, we realized that, yeah, we can make some decent money doing it, but it's so seasonal. We only do individual health plans and you can only sell those during an open enrollment period, which right now is November 1st through December 15th. So six weeks a year is when we can earn our revenue. So we're like, what are we going to do for the rest of the year? I said, well, you know, maybe I could find some sort of seasonal sales job that's busy in the spring, summer, fall. And then I just go back to selling insurance in the winter and rinse and repeat. So we happened to meet a guy that owned a painting business at my church and met him on a Sunday decided to partner with up with him by Tuesday. And so for about five years, I ran his business. And so when I, when I decided to not buy his company and start my own, it wasn't like I was starting hundred percent fresh. I knew how to do it. I knew how to sell jobs. I knew how to price jobs. I knew how to find subs. I knew how to project manage. And so the, I was able to take all of that knowledge on top of the money that we had been saving up to launch very, very, very quickly. So I, I had every advantage when Ellison painting was launched. Um, Mm -hmm. certainly wasn't easy. Uh, but I do recognize that it's unusual. Most people are not going to be able to do what we did in a short time. Most people don't have that foundation, right? Most people have to earn that foundation. Like, you know, you, you were fortunate enough to be paid while you were learning those lessons, whereas Mm -hmm. most people have to pay to learn those lessons. And most people are trying to transition from being a painter to being a business owner. And I never had to make that transition. And not only did I not have to make that transition, there was zero chance that I was ever going to have to transition back to being a painter. I I was forced to put together highly profitable, highly scalable systems in order to really feed my family and make the business as successful as, as I needed it to be as quickly as I needed it to be. Yeah. You can't get pulled back on the tools because you don't know how to use the tools. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. You know, when I was, when I was running my painting business, it was, it was kind of the same. Like I was a terrible painter, but I could teach someone how to paint. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I painting wasn't even an option. Yeah. So, so during that startup period, um, I imagine that there were some days, some weeks, maybe even a few months where there were some sacrifices that have had to be made and you weren't working five hours a day that whole time, I imagine. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was actually probably working less than, than I am now. Okay. <laughs> Sounds really silly. Yeah. Uh, the, the biggest, people hating you listening to you right now. <laughs> yeah. The biggest sacrifice we made was I, I knew that when we launched, I couldn't sell and manage projects at the same time if we wanted to grow quickly. And so the, I actually talked my wife into um, coming out of retirement. Now, I, I say that term jokingly because she actually runs our health insurance agency now full time. Um, when I say full time, I'm sorry. She runs it 100 percent full. It's three days a week for six weeks. That's that's her responsibilities really for that business. But she had worked with me at the other painting company for a while as a project manager and scheduler. So when we decided to leave that company and start our own, she had been a, essentially a stay at home mom for the previous three, four years. So the biggest sacrifice we made was that she, she committed to working with me full time for six months to launch so that we could scale up quickly. And then the, the deal was at the end of the six months, we would transition her out, replace her. So she could go back to um, running the insurance business and, and being at home with the kids. My time, my schedule really didn't change much from when I was running the old company to when I launched my company. Cause I was still doing the same thing. Yeah. I was, I was paying to have leads generated. I was, uh, I, I was scheduling the estimates myself though. Our CRM makes that pretty stinking easy. Uh, and then I was just going and doing estimates. I was recruiting subcontractors, yeah. uh, but my wife was really managing all of that. So I was able to focus on the things that I'd been focused on for the previous five years anyway. So let's look at this startup period. What were the, so if you break it down into sales, marketing, and production, uh, or let's go marketing sales and production, what were, mm -hmm. what were the marketing lead generation systems that you used to get your start? So we immediately um, paid for a bunch of branding. I'm really proud of like our logo and, and all of that. We have a pretty consistent um, branding theme through all of our marketing, which also meant that I had my truck wrapped. So it looked looked like we were the biggest, baddest company in town <laughs> right from day one before I even Great. sold a job. We hired an agency to build a website, to start working on SEO, to do Google AdWords. Uh, we hired another agency to do uh, Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, and then we also launched pretty quickly a pretty significant door hanger campaign. So we had a local company here that prints and distributes them for us. I think we, I think we sent out like 60,000 door hangers in 2022, which we have way amped that up this year. Okay. So branding, branding, Facebook and Instagram door hangers. That's a lot of door hangers. And you know, at the start, uh, for some, you know, so you definitely had a budget. So what do you think you spent before you generated your first dollar? Well, so we, we committed to spending $13,000 a month in marketing from day one. Okay. Now we had such Where'd that a number come from. We, I worked it backwards from, you know, what is our, what are, what are our sales goals for the first 12 months? And I, I want to do one and a half million, you know, what's, uh, essentially 10% of that for high growth, it's about whatever about that yep. about 13,000. Um but we had such a fast launch because w when we decided to launch Ellison Painting, people were just coming out of the woodwork wanting to hire us because it was me and my wife. Yep. So we had out of that first million dollars worth of sales and revenue in 2022, uh, I think 42 or 43% of that was word of mouth and referrals. Wow. Now that also that, that also takes into account like people that saw our, our yard signs and stuff like that. But really, paid marketing only accounted for 50, I get, what's the difference? 57, 58% of year one. So that helped. A um, lot of word and, of mouth. Having that type of like branding is, is, is super helpful. And oftentimes, you don't even recommend a new business to go you know, hard on branding because they need to cash flow leads. But, mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like the branding was really valuable for you. I think so. I mean, consistency is king. And so they're seeing our Facebook ads. They're coming across our organic Instagram ads. They're getting our door hanger, our mailer to their house. We, we were, in, we're in front of everyone. They're seeing our vehicles driving on the road. I can't tell you how many times last year people were saying, oh, I see your, I see your vehicles everywhere. 
well, we only had one vehicle. It's just my, <laughs> my truck. Right. But yeah. because they're seeing our logo and our name everywhere, it was, we were top of mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's wicked. That's mm -hmm. really great. So you, you come out the gate swinging, mm -hmm. love to see it. What did the sales systems look like? It was, it was, it was you, I imagine, at least at the start doing mm -hmm. all the estimates. Yep. hundred percent. Um, as far as sales systems, you mean like CRM and estimating platform? Sure. And all that? Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Did you use drip jobs or like what CRM do you use? Yeah, we used, we used drip jobs and we still do. Uh, it's, it was a really nice platform, especially when we launched because we were running so lean with just me and my wife, it was just like the perfect solution for us. It was handling incoming lead requests, sending out automated text messages. So in order to schedule my estimates, which I did, I don't know, 25 or 30 estimates a week, most of those people I never even had to call because they, they request an estimate. All I had to do was pull it up in drip jobs, see yeah. when they were, wanted to have me out there and schedule it. Sends them a confirmation and I just show up. So it allowed me to really not do much of that follow-up that we all know it's probably better if we do. We're doing that yeah. now, but I didn't have to then. I was paying so much for leads that they were just coming in and I was just cherry picking the ones that I wanted to see, scheduling them and showing up. Yeah. Okay. And so you are you still doing your own sales? You said you're doing a few estimates. Do you have a sales rep as well? Yep. I, I still do sales full-time, essentially. Um, I do about 25 estimates a week, and then I have one other full-time sales guy. Okay. What are, your, what are your responsibilities now? So the business is hopefully going to do two and a half this year, going to keep growing from there. Mm -hmm. What's, what is your scorecard? What's your job responsibilities day to day? So estimates, of course. Um, again, I don't schedule them anymore. We have uh, a scheduler that handles all of that for me. Um, so show up, do estimates. Um, I manage the overall strategy of the team. I manage our marketing vendors. Um, I'm essentially the, the visionary. I don't, I don't do anything with project management. I have a, a three person project management team, uh, yeah. boots on the ground, job site visits, invoices, collections, review requests, all of that. Um, so my, my job, um, my functional job really ends as soon as someone says yes to a sale outside of that, it's just kind of managing the operations and, and leading the team. Okay. Yep. Uh, recruiting, do you use only subs or do you have any uh, in-house employees? The only in-house employee is our project manager, sales and admin. Okay. Um, hundred percent of our painters are subcontractors. Awesome. Yeah, that's so problem. I do help in the recruitment of that. Um, but I just transitioned all the interviewing and onboarding to my project management team. It's easier for me to attract subcontractors just because guys in the area, um, either know me or have heard of me. It's easier for me to kind of get them on the lure. And then once I have that, I hand them over to my team and they vet them and interview them and onboard them. So I think a big, it sounds like a big skill of yours is the ability to see a system and create it and then delegate it. A, a big skill of mine is to see a system, uh, duplicate it. It was someone else's system that I liked and make it a little bit better. Okay. That's really my skill. <laughs> I always so, say creativity is so overrated. All you got to do is if, if someone has already figured out how to do something, just do what they're doing and maybe see if you can just do it a little bit better. hundred percent, hundred percent. So if you, if you walked us through the process of just this recent transition, so before you were doing, uh, you know, you're interviewing, you're onboarding, and now you're having your project managers do that. So how do you go about creating a process and then training somebody else on it? Well, so we, the first thing we did, even before we launched, my wife and I wrote out some pretty clearly defined SOPs for almost everything. We dictated the entire customer journey. So from the moment they learn about Ellison painting and, and reach out to us for an estimate, what does their experience look like? What are the different interaction points? Who's responsible for those interaction points and what do we want the end result to be? So we had, you know, customer journey from beginning to end. When we kick off a job, what are all the things that need to be done? When we're wrapping up a job, what are all the things that need to be done? We, so we had those systems before we even did our first job. Now that I have a more substantial team, that's not just me and my wife, we, we revisit those on a quarterly basis to update them. All right. What did we learn over the last quarter to do better? And so my, my team is all very clearly aligned on how we operate and what our expectations are, which makes it then very easy. Well, I should say it's not very easy, way easier 
to bring someone on board and fit them into that system. So we just hired a new project manager. Her name's Allison. She has no painting experience, which by the way, essentially no one on my internal team has any painting experience. Uh, but she's a phenomenal person and she's a hard worker and she's very smart. So when we brought her on board, she's been here for two and a half weeks. She's basically up to speed and is fully managing these, these projects after two and a half weeks because we had systems in place. We didn't have to try to figure out how we're going to explain it. It's like, hey, here's all our SOPs. You know, my, my right-hand man, my other project manager kind of walked her through the first week and trained her hands on. And then basically yeah. checklists, right? Checklists, right. How to start a job, checklist. How to close out a job, checklist. How to talk to a customer, checklist. How to collect payment, checklist. Mm -hmm. You got it. SOPs, man. NickSlavic.com. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah the king of systems right yeah i'm actually talking to him later today and uh excited to dig into to his processes about about systems hey when you uh when you when you talk to him today ask him how long it took him to get 100 google reviews because yeah, we just got our 100th like two days ago okay congrats man thanks <laughs> big milestone i will ask nick i will tell him it's coming from you <laughs> right so so you've mapped that was that's really cool actually the fact that you mapped out your customer journey your kickoffs your wrap ups before you even produced a job I'm sure there are some iterations to the systems as you as you go because like the you know the V1 of the system is not going to be the final system right how no, do you identify when things need to be fixed or changed or updated well the final system is never going to be the final system I'm a firm believer that nothing is ever perfect things can always be made better though oftentimes good enough is good enough to start. Love right. That. Yeah. Love it. And so, uh, I mean, I even had a conversation with Allison on my drive home last night. She's two and a half weeks in. And I said, listen, you're smart. We trust your judgment and we love getting outsiders perspective. So as you are going through and following our SOPs, if you're noticing bottlenecks, if you're seeing areas where, uh, you think things might need to be improved, even if you don't have an idea how to prove it, let us know. If you have an idea, let us know. And if we've said, and we might tell you, eh, yeah, we've tried that a hundred times. This <laughs> here, here's why we do this, right? Uh, but we are constantly just looking at that to make it better and better. Uh, not to reinvent the wheel, but if we can make if we can make our operations one percent better each week, I mean, we're going to continue to grow at a phenomenal scale because we're we are. I think we're already the best painting company in the area, but we're going to be so much better than everyone else that it's going to make our growth feel even easier. So when it comes to this recent transition that you did from getting rid of your interview and an onboarding, what were the steps that you took to document those processes and then train your project management team? Well, the first thing is I had him, he was kind of doing them hand in hand with me. I would do all the recruiting. He would be in the interviews. I would interview the people and then we would onboard him together. We had the onboarding steps, you know, here, what do we need from them? in order to get them on board, their liability certificate, their workers comp, the W-9, the subcontractor agreement. So he witnessed all that. Then we simply wrote it down. Now he just does it. <laughs> so simple. How come you make this thing so simple? <laughs> yeah. You know, people are, are banging their heads against their walls, trying to figure out how to create systems for these various operational tasks. And then you just come out and you uh, make it sound very easy. Well, I think people, some people, and I know painters especially run into this a lot, is they struggle with wanting everything to be perfect before they, you know, they launch it. Yeah. And nothing's ever going to be perfect. It, you know, in business school, you learn about your an MVP, a minimum viable product. And essentially, as soon as you have something of value that is functional and people are willing to pay for, you launch. And then the MVP eventually, over many iterations, turns into your final product or your final service. But if you wait until you have your final product or service, the market may have changed completely. You may have missed your opportunity, or maybe you've just spent months or years developing a product or service that doesn't even have any value that you would have found out a year ago had you just launched with an MVP. And so, you know, perfection is, is some people's greatest enemy. They're, they're worried about implementing a system because it's not going to be the perfect system. Well, a system is better than no system. And once you implement a system, you can make it better. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer of done is better than perfect. And yeah. I tell my clients all the time, just send it, get it out the door. Don't worry about it. Don't overanalyze it. Just get it done, get it sent out, and then you can iterate from there. Right. <sighs> Wicked.
So let's go back to your, your family values. How do you, what types of like, you know, faith and family are important to you. They're important to a lot of people. Family, especially is, is super important to me. The way that I do my schedule, not that you asked, but, uh, (laughs) how do you do your schedule, Mike? Oh, thanks, Brad. I was waiting for you to ask that. Uh, so I, I have to work out before my kids wake up. Okay. But recently, my daughter, my four-year-old has been waking up at 545 on the dot every single morning. So I've been taking her on runs and I've been working out with her in the garage. So it's been a lot. Um, and then I get them off to daycare around eight o'clock. My wife goes to work and then I start work. I work from nine till 430, mm-hmm. nine till four, 430. And then I pick them up and I do not work. I leave. I try my best. My wife will say I'm terrible at it, but I try my best <laughs> to leave my phone in a different room from 430 till 730. Yeah. Right. And then from 730, again, you know, clean the house, you get caught up and then a little bit of emails, a little bit of work if I have to. But I try not to, because like you said, that's that's wife time. Mm -hmm. So what types of, you know, lessons do you think you could share with people on, you know, how focusing on family and having that time away from the business actually helps you run a better business? So the more the more focus I give to my wife and my kids the more freedom I have for my wife and my kids to do the things that I need to do for the business to be successful. My, my wife, I think I do a pretty good job. Certainly not perfect. My wife would probably say not perfect uh, of really prioritizing them. I mean, they, you know, it's, it's in that order. It's faith, family, and fitness. So my faith, you know, my relationship with God is, is number one, of course, but as far as earthly relationships go, I have some really, really great friends. I really, really like the people that I work with, but man, I could not love my wife and my kids any more than I do. You know, it's, and so if I, if I put the focus on them, the, the times when I say, Hey, I got invited to speak at this thing in in October in Arizona. Um, is it all right if I go? My wife's like, yeah, if you think it's going to be good for you and the business, you should absolutely go. Uh, oh, well, Nick Slavic's having another retreat this winter. I'm going to be gone for like five days. Do you think it's going to be good for the business? Yeah, I think it's going to be good for the business. And I think it's going to be good for my mental state. And my wife, it's like, you should absolutely go. I mean, I just spent a week uh, in Tulsa serving as a judge for this entrepreneur reality show. My wa- And I only was able to do that because my wife, you know, picks up the, uh, the weight on the back end and takes care of the family while I'm gone. But she- I bet she wouldn't be willing to do that if I wasn't a very attentive husband and a very attentive father, right? So I've just found that the more I focus on them, the more freedom I have to do the things that I need to do in business and the more supportive they are. My wife is my freaking biggest cheerleader. She never questions a single thing with the business. She lo- We talk about it, um, you know, because she she's hyper aware of what it takes to run this business in particular. And of course she's a co-owner. Uh, we talk <laughs> yeah. strategy. We, I keep her up to date on everything, but ultimately, you know, if I decide to hire, fire, spend, invest, um, she trusts me implicitly, but she wouldn't if I wasn't a good husband and dad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's a good lesson. Um, I mean, it, it's, it sounds like, you know, there's, there's selfless reasons, but there's also selfish reasons to be attentive and to be a good dad and a good husband, right? Like the selfless, like it's wonderful and it's good for the family and it's good for everything. But you also get the selfish reasons as well, which is of course. you get to have, do the fun things and you get to run the business with full autonomy. And you get to have a wife that actually likes you and a kid that kids that are actually excited when you get yeah, home. That's, yeah, that's, right? just, I mean, that's, that's just too bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. And even when it comes to like the, the fitness side, I, I mean, hypothetically, I could just quit work every day at two 30 and go home. But for me, I know if I go to the gym and I, you know, die in a workout and just like beat my body, I'm working out aggression and any, any of the, the pains or the frustrations that I had with my work day are going to be totally cleared out by the time I'm done. And I'm going to be home. Um, my brain's going to be focused and my family's going to have my full attention. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the exact same way. If I'm, you know, if I don't work out for two, three days, I start getting antsy and then my wife Mm -hmm. starts to notice it. And like, it's, I don't like how I feel and and how I react to different things. And it's just the the dopamine that you get from a, from a good workout can't really be replaced with anything else. Also, I married a woman that is way better looking than me. So I have an obligation to have my body (laughs) look good for her. 
right? It's for, really for her. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> So what do you do during the, during the, your, um, you know, afternoons or evenings, if a fire bubbles up in your business that requires your attention, do you let it interrupt your, your family time or do you try to, you know, push it to the next day? Uh, so, you know, Corey Leister has a really nice saying that there's no paint emergencies, which is like 99% true. So for the most part, m any issues that come up, can, can be pushed to the next day. And I tell my, my team that exact same thing, but sometimes we have crews that are working a little bit later. They're work, they want to wrap up a job. They're at a house till six, seven, eight o'clock. If something pops up, they have the, the freedom to reach out to me and my team after hours. And if it's, if it's something that they need help with that I actually need to step in on, then I will, but we've built a culture that that's not the expectation. And so it doesn't happen very often. So when it does happen, it's not a big deal. What's the last thing that you got pulled into? Um, we've had we've had a couple issues recently where Mark, my other sales guy, um, we're, we're starting to produce the jobs that he sold when he was brand new. And so we're running into a few estimates that were a little hairy. Right. <laughs> so I've been pulled into a couple situations where. Uh, you know, having to deal with the subcontractor, how much can we pay them? You override some budget. Yeah. Telling that, you know, the, the customer that, you know, this was kind of misbid. We got to charge you more money. There was one recently I got called in on a Saturday morning because um, one of the crews had trimmed back some tree branches too far. And so I had to go talk to the customer and, and you know, smooth it over <laughs> really in the grand scheme of things. It's all like minor, minor yeah. things. Yeah. You know, when you say no paint emergencies or when Corey says no paint emergencies, I mean, even that, you know, over trimming a branch, like what's, what is the worst thing that could happen if you responded the next day? Well, the worst thing is that they could just hop on Google and leave us a, a bad review because we didn't respond right away. And so yeah. I'm, I always, I always balance. Like if it's, if it's something like that, or if it's an unhappy customer, I know that I'm going to score a lot of points by responding immediately, even if it's just to say, hey, I got your message. It's actually family night tonight, so I can't come out tonight, but I'm happy to swing over first thing tomorrow, you know, right as the kids are waking up. Can I be there at 8.15? Okay, great. And even that alone, you know, the, the, the one minute conversation just to let them know, hey, got you on my radar, going to take care of it. Everything's fine. I'll be there tomorrow. That, yeah. that alone will solve the problem. Yeah, that's great. And and just setting that, that expectation and being the owner and being uh, accessible, you know, to your team and to your customers when when things do get a little bit of hair, I think that's important. Mm -hmm. How would you recommend someone who's stuck in the day to day? They're maybe not their may, they're maybe not painting anymore, but they're just they're just responsible for everything. Their painters are bringing them problems. Their customers are, you know, always calling and blowing up their phone all day and all night. How can someone get out of that cycle? Man, no easy answer, but like, what would you, what would you do if you were in that situation? I think step one is to, if you're going to be hiring people, hire, hire good people. Nick talks about decent human beings and that's, that's a real thing. Uh, I found that you can hire people that are decent human beings, just good, reliable people. And if they're a culture fit, if they're a values fit, really you can teach them to do what you need them to do, whether that's project management or sales or painting. So if a lot of, a lot of the issues that painters run into, it's because of their team, you know, the painters are letting the customers down or, uh, their, their subcontractors, their project managers are letting the customers down. It's usually not a function of the owner because the owner hypothetically is the only person that guaranteed cares about the health of the company and the reputation of the company. So I guess that would be my first thing is as you bring people on, try to avoid the, the temptation to hire the people with experience because you think they're going to be easier to train. I think people without experience, but good values and good culture fit are going to be way easier to train and way more healthy for the organization long term. But the other thing I would say, and this is you know coming from maybe a position of privilege, is that people that are trying to grow their business need to take risks. And sometimes that means hiring people before you can actually afford them. Sometimes it means paying way more for marketing than you're comfortable paying because you believe that leads are going to come in and you can sell and then produce it. Taking, the, taking those, those risks could mean a lot of things. Um, that's a huge strength of my wife and I 
is that we are, uh, we, we have virtually no aversion to risk. Well, she does. I don't. She, she, my, my aversion to risk has paid off for us. So she trusts me when I say, yeah, we got to do this. Um, but we really, I mean, we left this, this cushy position that I had running some other company. I was making a ton of money. We had the opportunity to buy it and we left and risked essentially all of our savings on whether Ellison painting was going to be successful or not. And calculated we, risk. Calculated risk. I knew the numbers. I knew how much I needed to spend in marketing. I knew what, how many painters I had to have uh, working for us. I knew that I needed a project manager and I knew how much that, that was going to cost. Um, taking risks, are, that's really the only way that people are going to get past those plateaus that they find themselves at. You know, the first plateau is what, maybe 250,000. And then maybe they get up to 750,000 or a million once they bring on a couple crews. And then once you get to a million, I think that's the hardest plateau to break. Because at that point, the the next big plateau is that like two and a half or three million. So that's a, that's a big investment if you want to get from a million three. That means doubling or tripling your internal staff, tr- doubling or tripling the number of painters you have, doubling or tripling your your marketing. It's, it's a pretty big jump. Yeah. So th- that's where I see a lot of guys getting stuck is like at that 750, 1 million. Do mm-hmm. you see the same thing? Yeah. Yeah. Cause getting to the, you know, getting to the sixty, seventy thousand dollars per month is you can still hustle that, mm-hmm. right? You can still do all your sales. You can still do your project management. Um, you know, you can even paint part time, you know, and, and manage a couple other crews. You'll be busy, but you can still do 78,000 a month, but it, you know, you're right. Getting to the hundred thousand a month, 150,000 a month, all of a sudden you need, you need real business systems. You need, you gotta be, you need to be relying on other people that are working yeah. with you. Yeah. The best hire I ever made in my, well, when I was running my, my painting business was my production manager. Mm-hmm. He, I, I trained him how to be a painter and then he painted for me for a year. And then I, I promoted him to production manager and man, that one, that one hire changed my life. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Ryan. <laughs> hey Ryan. Good job, great, buddy. Great dude. Is he still uh, working with you? Uh, no, he's not. He's, uh, he's, um, he started his own business actually. He's doing some real estate stuff. So he's, he's crushing Good it for him. Um, so taking risks, you know, baseball analogy, you can't get a home run unless you swim, swing big. And mm-hmm. I'm still taking risks in my business. I'm sure you're still taking risks in your business. So how would you, how would you recommend someone calculate that risk? Say they're doing that, you know, they're 600, 700 K a year, you know, run rate. What's the risk that you should take at that point And how should you do it? So I think that an owner operator can get to that level, the 600, 700 K by selling, and project managing all of the jobs, right? For sure. I mean, really, I, I sell, yeah, I, I can sell 1.75 million a year without trying too hard. So cut that in half, and I could probably manage those projects as well. But <laughs> at, at our level, once you hit that 1.5, 1, 1. 1.5 million, you cannot do both. So the biggest risk is hiring either a project manager or a sales guy. And so the those owner, are the two, those are the two hires. Those are, yeah, that's yeah. Those the are owner the operators got to figure out which one do you like doing and which one are you best at? Now for me, it was a no brainer. I, I'm not organized. Uh, I don't want to be scheduling jobs. I actually like kicking off jobs and, and, and managing the crews, but I'm not a project manager. I'm hundred percent a sales guy. So logically my first hire was a project manager. Now the cheat code of course, was that I convinced my wife to work for me, which was free. Um, but even then when, when she stepped back in October and we were heading into slow season, I had to replace her. And so even going into essentially a, a five or six month, um, time frame in which I knew we were going to make very, very little money. I still hired an extremely talented person who didn't have any painting experience, didn't really have any project management management experience, but he's very smart, very organized, and I committed to paying him way above market rate because I needed that first hire to be an absolute home run, right? So that's that's the that's the big risk is that first hire, and it's yeah. either sales or it's either sales or project management. The second risk is is the marketing spend. You know, I I'm on all these these Facebook groups for painters. So many guys are like. Oh, you don't need to pay for marketing. I get, I get all my jobs from word of mouth. If you just have a good reputation, get some yard signs and you're going to stay busy. Yeah. You're going to keep you and your nephew busy nonstop <laughs> exactly. through word of mouth and yard signs. But if you want to get past the six or 700,000, 
and into the million, two million, three million, paid marketing absolutely has to be a big part of your business. And if if you want to talk numbers, like a, a very slow growth or maintaining your business, it's like three to four percent of your gross revenue should be spent in marketing. Uh, if you want to grow a little bit more quickly, maybe it's four to seven, and a super aggressive growth is seven to ten percent. Well, we we budget for ten percent. Yep. Right. Now we came 10% in percent of your goal revenue, not 10% goal of revenue, which other people, exactly. Which people don't understand. It's like when 2023 started and our goal was 3 million, I started spending based on a $3 million revenue, not based on the million that we had just produced. Yeah. That's yeah. like the whole, uh, dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Mm-hmm. You have and that's stressful, that. man. You start spend, you start spending that money in the winter and you're like, I don't have that much money left in my yeah. account and I'm still spending. But then the leads start pouring in and you're booking jobs. The, I mean, I, even at the end of this year with our, we, we actually ended up scaling back our marketing spend a little bit because we, uh, we were overproducing or overselling, I should say. Yeah. Um, so we'll probably end up being at like seven to 8% for the year. Marketing okay. spend. That's great. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if you can stay below that 10% with the, the type of growth that you're trying to have, then, you know, you're, you're obviously doing something right. What's your, what is your average job size throughout the year? Uh, last year was about 6,200 this year. I think it's trending a little lower, um, maybe around 55, 57. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, two, two big risks, like you said, bringing on that sales or project manager. Um, I always recommend project manager first. I find that's the easier, jo- easier role to fill. Um, but you know, to each their own and then, and then that marketing spend. So hire good people, right? Hire, uh, what did you say? How did you say Nick describe said- that? Decent human beings. Hire decent human beings. So what do you do in your interview process from, you know, from the very start, you know, recruiting, posting your ad to the interview process and qualification and hire? How do you make sure you're hiring decent humans? So we put a lot of emphasis on core values here at Ellison Painting. Um, and so we talk about those in the initial, I talk about them one-on-one in the initial interview, phone interview with these candidates. You know, I talk about, you know, integrity and professionalism and fairness and merit-based opportunities and levity. Those are our five core values. And I explain what each of those mean to me and to our company. And I ask them, you know, do any of those resonate with you? Any of them, you know, make you feel weird. And if, if they're not on board with the core values, then they're not going to make it to the next part of the interview process. And they're certainly not going to meet my team. Um, so that's, that's what we focus on. Yeah. We tell them how the job operates and what the expectations are, but, but really we focus very heavily on the core values and the, the second piece is the culture fit. So when, when we are deciding who we are going to bring on, we actually, I have my whole management team interview that person with me. Cause I want everyone to be on board, everyone to meet them, see if we can f- get a sense of whether they're going to gel with the rest of the team. Cause we levity is, is one of our core values. That's lightheartedness. So we like to make jokes and we like to laugh and we like to tease each other and like, it might sound silly, but if we're going to bring someone on board, it's important that they kind of jive with that. Otherwise it's very awkward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You got to be able to take a joke. Yeah. And we learned the lesson the hard way that project manager I had to let go. Um, we hired him because we needed a project manager and he had painting experience and I had known him for, for a number of years and, uh, didn't really, didn't really do our due diligence to verify whether he was actually a core value or culture fit. We, we hired someone cause we needed someone and it cost me a lot of money and a lot of anxiety and a lot of heartache. Yeah. Hiring when you're in a position of desperation is always a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully I learned that lesson the hard way one time mm-hmm. and we will hopefully not make that mistake again. So as the business grows, how do you, how do you avoid that? How do you for, foresee and project which team members you need and uh, put them in a place before you need them? So we have our org chart kind of sketched out now um, and for the future. So the, the current plan for 2024 is we're going to try to aim for 5 million in revenue. Well, I know that based on industry benchmarks, that's going to be um, essentially three salespeople, three project managers. In order to facilitate those six, then we're going to need to have uh, one project scheduler. We're going to need one estimate scheduler. And then we may just need an extra admin. 
And at that point, I'm hoping to not actually be selling at all. So I can transition really to full-time CEO. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then I, I will still have a hand in recruiting and hiring and a little bit of that. So the I, I just look at the the industry benchmarks based on what all of my friends in the industry have done. And the general consensus is for every one and a half million in revenue and production, you need one sales guy and one project manager. Yeah. So for four million, you're gonna go for three. Or no, you said five million. Five million. I think it'll be a stretch, you know. Can we yeah. can we get each of these guys to do or girls to do a little bit more than one and a half? Yeah. And we could meet it. I mean, or but if I, you if you do, you know, keep your hand a little bit in it too, you need to do a couple of week. Yeah, and that's that's the thing. I, I I know a lot of people transition out fully from the field. Um, you know, we, whether that's away from the brush or away from estimating. I actually really enjoy doing estimates. So I could see myself continuing to do a day or two of estimates as long as it's not taking opportunities away from my salespeople. Yeah. If it's adding to the business rather than taking away, then I'll, I'll continue to do it. For so sure. Like, if they're, if they're, you know, booked out, you don't want to be take, cause that, that takes, you know, earning opportunity away from your team, which is not exactly, same. exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to save 10% on this job, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. And also we were aiming for five and maybe we'll end up at four and a half, just like we we aimed at three and maybe we'll end up at two and a half. Yeah. Um, two and a half will still be a pretty big victory for us. If you aimed at two and a half though, you wouldn't have done two and a half. You're right. You're right. Gotta aim high. Yeah. So um, yeah, huge, huge shifts in a lot of, in, in, in the potential of your business. If you take that jump before you're ready and bring on, project manager, or even if you're, you know, the, the step before that, I would argue for, for someone who's on the tools right now would be a, uh, a foreman, just someone who can manage one project at a time to give you the freedom to do estimate sales recruiting. For sure. If, if an owner operator can focus on just doing estimates like one day a week, that may be enough to keep them and their crew working nonstop at more profitable jobs. The problem is a lot of these guys are just trying to squeeze estimates in as their schedule allows. And, you know, maybe that works, but maybe it doesn't. And maybe they're always late for estimates because they're trying to wrap up a job. And, you know, that's not going to set them up for the best opportunities to, to win that bid, right? Absolutely not. No Especially problem. when they're bidding against companies like mine, where we're <laughs> not only showing up on time, we're usually showing up early and we're texting we're on, when we're on our way and we're driving uh, new clean vehicles and our, our estimates look amazing with photos and highly detailed descriptions. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't envy those guys bidding against us. No. And that's how you want to be, how to do everything in business, right? You want to make it so you feel sorry for your competition. Right. I love yeah. that. I remember when uh, I, but that being here, sa- sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> All right. Well, what I was going to say is that being said, I want other companies to do what we're doing. And so I've, I've freely shared our processes and even the language in our estimates with other companies in my area, because I would much rather be bidding against two other companies like mine rather than, you know, two guys that are painters and drive trucks because their price is going to be half of mine, right? I'd rather give an estimate for 10,000 and two other companies give them estimates at 9,500 and 9,000. And then all we get, now we're just fighting for, who, you know, who can convince them that we're going to be the, the most professional option, right? Yeah. I don't have to fight on price anymore. Yeah, this brings up a really good point around scarcity and abundance. Mm-hmm. And I, I firmly believe that we live in a world of abundance and everyone can win. It's not a zero sum game. Especially in our industry, man. There, is, there are so many painting jobs to go around that me winning a job does not mean that someone else is losing a job. There is more. We lose two out of three estimates we give anyway. Right. And we have more than enough, but there's, there's plenty of work, but there's a, there's a lot of scarcity mindset. I remember I was doing a, I was doing a customer survey once to, to my coaching clients. And I asked them how, how likely would you be to recommend this program to, I think that the language that I use, how likely would you be to recommend this to a competitor or to another painting contractor? And someone gave me a one because they're like, I don't want anyone else to know what mm-hmm. I'm, you're teaching me. <laughs> That's the old school mentality for sure. That's changing. It's changing very quickly in our industry. It's we have we have these local like, guys people like Nick and the PCA yep. and like raising up the industry to, to be more professional. So there's not mm-hmm. the the chuck and the trucks texting over a quote with no professionalism. Yeah, we have these local gathering groups now that are kind of pseudo sponsored by the PCA, and I I, I run the Michigan uh, Michigan group, and the painting community nationwide, and I can speak to it more specifically in in Michigan is just 
it's becoming um, way more collaborative. Uh, I like to share the story where I was out doing an estimate for a cabinet job and the, the lady says, um, you know why I called you for an estimate? I was like, I don't know. This time of year, most people call because we offer discounted pricing or a free color consultation. She goes, no, uh, I actually posted on a, on the local Facebook group saying that I was looking for a, a cabinet refinisher and Valerie King from King cabinet refinishing responded and said, Hey, we, we refinish cabinets. And then you responded to her and said, Hey, we also refinish cabinets, but you should absolutely hire Valerie. She's the best. She's like, so I really just like the way that you interacted with one of your competitors. And so I invited you out. Now I ended up winning that job actually over Valerie, <laughs> but strictly our prices were, I think were about the same. Uh, but because of the size of my operation, I could get started in two weeks and she was like two months out, but that's, it was, it was a really nice snapshot of, I didn't respond to that lady's post saying, Oh, don't hire Valerie, hire me. No, it's yeah. like, or, Oh or yeah, just, I'm the best, right? Yeah. No. Hey, if you hire Valerie, if you hire Nick Kelly from elite pro, if you hire Steve Burnett from the paintly company, you are going to have phenomenal service. Um, and just from that alone, I've gotten people call us because they just like the way that we, they see us interacting online. hundred percent. It's uh, yeah. you know, it's not necessarily the power of positivity, but, but having that type of positive abundance mindset, I mean, people just gravitate towards that. People want to be with people who make them feel good and, and believing in abundance makes people feel mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's excellent, man. Um, and I think that's a great, I think that's a great place to, to stop for today. Live what's a life name? of abundance. And what's your dog's name? My dog's name is Marty. Marty is a <gasps> uh, St. Bernard uh, Bernese mountain dog. Love it. For anyone listen to audio, we're just showing him on camera. Open up your Spotify and look at him. <laughs> He's just a puppy. He's uh, eight months old. Nice. We have a nine month old puppy. She just got fixed this week. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Both our dogs are rescue dogs. My older dog is uh, her name is Calvin Johnson. I'm a big Detroit Lions fan. Wicked. <laughs> and uh, the puppy is Sherwin. We call her Winnie. Amazing. Yeah. Wonderful. Love dogs. Can't live without them. Yep. Well, you are doing something amazing in this industry, Brad. Uh, first off, great meeting you. Uh, definitely overdue. I'm glad mm -hmm. that I'm doing this so we could have a good chat. And congratulations on the business. Sounds like you need a side hustle. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Something else to keep you busy. I have, a, I have like a million ideas for side hustles and uh, not interested right now. Yeah, that's totally fair, man. Any last words that you want to leave or inspire people with? No, I mean, I just want to say thank you for having me. Um, guys like you that partner with guys like me are really important within this industry. High integrity guys. I'm really happy to hear that you're you know, a family guy uh, like I am and a lot of us are. Uh, so, yeah. So thank you for, for doing this. And, um, yeah, I would just say. The, the two things that I like to encourage people with, uh, we already talked about one of, one of them is, is to take risks. You're not going to have any big rewards if you're not taking risks. So, so really swing for the fences. But the second one I think is more important, and that is um, I encourage people to live open-handedly. Uh, you know, my wife and I do pretty well financially, and the business is successful. I think it's pretty successful, and we're doing pretty good financially because – we release a lot of that back to the people that work with us. Uh, we have, I'm very, very proud to say that we have multiple painters that are making over hundred thousand dollars a year, just painting for Ellison painting. And, you know, I have people on my staff here that are going to make six figures um, within their first year. The, the more open-handed we are, um, the more generous, generous we are. Uh, I see the more return we get. Um, and that's not why you do it. Of course right? You don't give to receive, but we were talking about earlier, you do something selflessly and there are selfish returns. I think for me, mentally, spiritually, even physically, the more I give, the more I get, and the more I get, the healthier I am for my family and my business. So those are my two things. Take risks, live open-handedly, man. It's a cycle. Yep. It's a, it's a world improving cycle. As long mm -hmm. as you can do that. Thanks again, Brad. Wonderful talking with you, man. And uh, I wish you nothing but success. See you in Arizona. Thanks for listening to the Painter Growth Podcast. If you want to grow your painting business, go to www.paintergrowth.com or click on the top link in the description. Talk soon.